ladies have said they have turned the camera on, so clean language from now on. This is forever on the interwebs. So, our last week on 1st and 2nd Samuel, not our last week of Bible study, but our last week on 1st and 2nd Samuel. We started this back in September, and this is lesson number 29. And I looked, and so far, we still have three of you that have been to every single lesson. I call you gluttons for punishments. But uh, before we jump in, let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for gathering us together where we can again study your word. We are eager, Lord, to hear what you have to say to us. And we pray, as always, that you would send your Holy Spirit to give us open ears and open eyes, open hearts, open minds, that we would receive all that you have to give to us today. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So again... This is salvation history. I've said it every single week, and that means this is a different kind of history that's being told. The history of God's faithfulness in the midst of our unfaithfulness. So we've seen a lot of good things in the story of Samuel and Saul and David. We've also seen some not so good things, right, over the time. But in the midst of all of that, God has been faithful in keeping his promises, keeping his covenant, moving closer and closer in history to the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we wrap up the story of David today, the Golden Age, or at least the first part of the Golden Age of Israel, Solomon's reign would also be included in that. Um, we're going to see three different pieces here today. First, we're going to see a list of David's mighty men. A king is only as great as the people who serve him. And so some space is going to be given here for uh, the best of the best in his fighting forces. Then we're going to see David's going to commit one more big boneheaded major mistake but we're going to end with hope and that's one of the things I love about first and second Samuel I know some of you struggled with it um, you don't love history as much as I do but we end with hope so keep that in mind as we dig in and I decided to be nice to you because <laughs> I didn't think that anybody would really want to raise their hand to read the long list of names? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Are you, you, you yeah. want, oh, oh, okay. I thought you were saying, oh, no, not me, thank you, I want to do that, okay. Well, we're going to pick up chapter 23 at verse 8, and let's listen to God's word here. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Josheb Bashabeth, a Tachemonite, was the chief of the three. He wielded his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. And next to him, among the three mighty men, was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the son of Hohohi. He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel withdrew. He rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the men returned after him only to strip the slain. And next to him was Shammah, the son of Aji the Hararite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot of ground full of lentils. And the man fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines, and the Lord worked a great victory. And three of the thirty chief men went down and came about harvest time to David 
at the cave of Adulam, when a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. And David said longingly, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. Then the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and carried and brought it to David. But he would not drink of it. He poured it out to the Lord and said, Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went at the risk of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. Now Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zariah, was chief of the thirty. And he wielded his spear against three hundred men, and killed them, and won a name beside the three. He was the most renowned of the thirty, and became their commander, but he did not attain to the three. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was a valiant man of Kabzeel, a doer of great deeds. He struck down two Ariels of Moab. He also went down and struck down a lion in a pit on a day when snow had fallen. And he struck down an Egyptian, a handsome man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but Benaiah went down to him with a staff and snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and won a name beside the three mighty men. He was renowned among the thirty, but he did not attain to the three. And David set him over his bodyguard. Asahel, the brother of Joab, was one of the thirty. Elhanan, the son of Dodo of Bethlehem, Shama of Herod, Alika of Herod, Helez the Paltite, Ira, the son of Ekesh of Tekoa, Abiezer of Anatot, Mebunai, the Hushathite, Zalman the Alohite, Mahari of Netophah, Heleb the son of Bada of Netophah, Etai the son of Ribai of Gibeah of the people of Benjamin, Benaiah of Pirithun, Hidai of the brooks of Gaash, Abi Alban of the Arbathites, Asmavath of Bahurim, Eliahaba of the Shalbanite, the sons of Jashan, Jonathan, Shama the Hararite, Ahiam the son of Sharar the Hararite, Aliphalet the son of Ahaspai of Maka, Eliab the son of Ahithophel of Gilo, Herzo of Carmel, Paari the Arbite, Egal the son of Nathan of Zobah, Bani the Gadite, Zelek the Ammonite, Nahari of Beirot the armor bearer of Joab the son of Zariah, Ira the Etrite, Gerad the Etrite, and Uriah the Hittite. 37 in all. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I pronounced none of them properly, okay? None of them, but they're not around to get offended, so. I don't remember these first words. Did we hear their story earlier on? Nope. Okay, so I wasn't missing. You're not. You're, you're not losing your mind, don't worry. All right. Well, you may be, but not over that. <laughs> I would not remember Joab and all of those. Right. Those were mentioned. But yeah. Okay. No, that's interesting. We'll get to that. Uh, but yeah, we've got 37 names here that fall into two groups. We've got the three, and we've got the 30. And these, I kind of think of them, these are the Green Berets. These are the seals, you know, the, the best of the best. But did anybody notice a problem here? How many people do we have on the list? I didn't count. 37. 37. And we've got the three. No, I'm not swift at math, but <laughs> so here's a couple options to make this work. Option number one: originally there was the thirty, and then they added a few more people, but they didn't change the name because we do that, right? You know. Venice Presbyterian Church is still up in the town of Ross. Ross has not been called Venice for how many decades? Over 100 years at least. But are they going to change the name to Ross Presbyterian Church? Nope. <laughs> so we do that. You know, we get a, a good name, a good title, and, and we don't change it. That's one option. The other option, we had a group of 30. And as people died, we put more people in, 
And so, of course, you know, if you're going to give all the names, it's going to be more than 30. Um, okay. The list in First Chronicles, which it's a different author writing of the same history, it has some additional names. So, you know, that might be um, a good warrant that they kept adding more people as people came up. Not entirely sure, can't solve that problem, but those make sense to me because that's the way things work, you know. So and so they were a part of the 30, and then they retired, they died, they aged out, whatever, and more people were put on, or they just and, kept adding and could people. Could a son have gone in under the same name? Could be, yeah. And sometimes yeah. they name them Yeah, senior sons. and junior, and yeah. So we start with the three, the three greatest warriors in David's time. And as Christine noticed, we have not heard of any of these people. None of them have been mentioned. Uh, which is kind of interesting that we get to the end in this appendix material and the author's like, oh yeah, I gotta tell you about this. You know, didn't find a place to fit it in. Uh, Josheb Bashabeth was the chief of the three and incredibly he defeated eight hundred people. We think we hear that story. Yeah, yeah, that's quite a story, right? Yeah. Now, like you, I have questions. He defeated 800 people single-handedly, or did he command folks that... That's a lot of rage. That, yeah. <laughs> it sure is. A lot of work. I, my arm would be tired after, yeah. Swing that's here. So it'd be a lot easier if he just had a, a grenade, yeah. you know, but they didn't have it then. So we don't really know. We just, that's, that's what we know about him. I, I find it fascinating to think there's this whole category of people that get one mention in the Bible, one verse, one mention that we know one thing about them. And to stop and think, what would the one thing be? That I would be known for, that you would be known for. If you got one verse, um, I, I remember doing a teaching for somebody on that and just picking a couple. In uh, Philippians, there's a place where Paul pleads with Euodia and Syntyche to agree together in the Lord. We know nothing about these women. We assume they were well-known people in the Philippian church. We assume they were leaders. What we know about them is they were fighting. <laughs> not a great legacy, right? You know, that's not striking down people with the jawbone of a donkey or, you know, sly, slaying 800 men in one battle. So, yeah. So second, we've got Eleazar, son of the very unfortunately named Dodo. And not the only Dodo in the chapter here. There's Dodo of Bethlehem. It's spelled differently in my version than yeah, NIV. Is it? It's D-O-D-A-I. Dodai. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'd have to go back and look what the original vowels were in the Hebrew. NIV. Yeah. Yeah. So Dodai is better than Dodo. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe they didn't have a bird back then, and Dodo was a perfectly fine name. Well, it, it so it was only ever on, on one island, so they probably didn't know about it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a it's a little dumb, but it it's a nice bird, probably. Well, not anymore. It's extinct. <laughs> yeah, it went the way of the dodo. But uh, too many trees. <laughs> no, they they laid their nest on the ground. Was part of the problem. Didn't they keep? running into, you know, you had them one way and they keep running into stuff and they can't figure out how to go around something. I thought that's what it did. Maybe, yeah. But anyway, Eliezer fought so valiantly that at the end his hand was cramped and he couldn't undo it. It had been, it had kind of fused with his sword. It was so cramped. That's his great uh, uh, valiant fighting here. He couldn't let go of his sword. And then Shama, the defender of the lentils. That's how I like to think of him. Um, lentils then as now was not considered high quality food. You know, it was not high refined. Wasn't, it was everyday food. 
Uh, but this man was so zealous, he defended even the humble lentil patch and defeated the Philistines. Now we're then told about this story about getting the water from the well in Bethlehem. And there's a little bit of confusion over whether it's these three, the three, who went and got this water, or if this was three out of the 30 and we're just not told the names, which three? There's a little bit of confusion as to who actually is doing this. Kind of depends on who you read and how they interpret it. But anyway, three of David's valiant men, whether it's the three or another group, um, does this wonderful deed of loyalty for their general, for their commander. This goes back to the time when David is on the run from Saul. He's in the cave. Remember what happened in the cave there? Um, he could have killed him. He could have killed Saul there, yeah. Um, but he's hiding out at this point, and the Philistines have captured Bethlehem. So David, as he is leading his men, says in a kind of throwaway line that he does not expect anybody to pay attention to, oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. You know and I know different water from different places tastes different. And he's longing for water from home. You know? And these three warriors sneak behind enemy lines just to, bring him just to bring him that water which they then bring back successfully and give to him and when they get back David recognizes what an incredible honor this is and he honors the men by not drinking the water. Wouldn't you be offended that you I went to that offended. land? I would have too, but <laughs> he then says, far be it from me that I should do this, shall I? This is the blood of my men. And I... He should I, have thought of that before he said it. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what they got to do. He just said he wanted to do it. He just away. So he pours it out as a drink yes. offering before the Lord. That's how he honors his men. He pours it out. He gives it to the Lord, basically, symbolically. I still would have wanted him to drink it. That's me, but, you know. <laughs> so then we're told about the 30. Did anybody notice there's a really big name? Joab. Joab is not on any of these lists. Just listed as the brother of Abishai. And the brother of Asahel. Asa. Yeah. But Joab is not included. He was the general, right? Yeah, he was a big dude. Because he caused so much trouble. But he did, yeah. And so he lost this honored status, clearly, because his brothers are included, but he is not. So we start with Abishai, Joab's brother, the chief of the 30, we're told over and over again, he was great, he was wonderful, he attained great honor, but he did not attain to the three. So he was top dog in the second tier. Um, 300 men, we don't know if that was 300 men at once or 300 men over the course of, either way it's impressive for a soldier. Um, and then next, Benaiah, the doer of great deeds. We've met Benaiah before as well. He, we are told, was the leader of the Carathites and the Pelathites. That's David's personal bodyguard, his personal troops. He's listed here that he's over the bodyguard. Um, and uh, he struck down, and here's one of the places we don't quite have a translation of a word. Mine says he struck down two Ariels of Moab. Now we immediately think that he killed the little mermaid twice, <laughs> right? 
Ariel is uh, a Hebrew word that means lion of God. That doesn't help, does it? No. So whether that was a, a title, whether that was, you know, a word that meant a valiant fighter, we just don't know. But he struck down two of them, whatever they were. Interestingly, as soon as he killed the lions of God, he also killed a lion. You know? Right, on a snowy day. On a snowy day, yeah. Oh, it's snow there. When I was in Israel, it did snow one day, of course, because it was a long family vacation. We go to the Middle East and it snows. Yeah. Um, and they said it hadn't snowed for 10 years. <laughs> we go and it's the weather's terrible what we want to look at is closed for cleaning uh, that's the long family vacations yeah. oh if you'd have come yesterday you could have seen it great yeah. when i was there it was the worst weather in 50 years oh you're like me barb yeah <laughs> the worst weather in 50 years yeah, yeah, that, that trumps mine because I was there 30 years ago. So. Well, you don't bring your coat to the Middle East. Yeah. Yeah. So he struck down a lion in a pit. I don't care. That's that's a big deal. Whenever I, I don't ever want to have to do that. Um, he also disarmed a mighty Egyptian, killing him with his own spear. That reminds us of David, right? Okay. When he cut off Goliath's head with Goliath's own sword. He was a handsome man. Yeah, I don't know why we were told that. That was interesting. I mean, he was mighty and he was a looker. Okay. Yeah. So... Um, and then we're just given a list of a whole bunch of people. There are one or two names we do recognize. Asahel is one of them. He is way back in 1 Samuel. He's the first of the brothers, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel, to die. He's the one that Abner killed because he kept running and would not stop. Um, and then because of that, Joab killed Abner. Uh, so he's remembered um, the beginning of the self-defense and the uh, revenge. We see Ahithophel, the Gilanite, again. Uh, he's not listed as a mighty warrior. Remember, he was the greatest advisor of David who defected to Absalom and that whole tourney do. Um, but his son is listed as one of the 30. And you'll remember Ahithophel is the grandfather of Bathsheba. Uh, and then that last name just lands with a thud, doesn't it? Uriah the Hittite, murdered by David. Indirectly, but murdered by David. Yeah. Um, he killed one of his best. It just makes it that much more incredible, you know, what David did. But it's a good transition to the next chapter. He maybe could have kept that quiet just to sort of cover that up again, but he didn't. Thankfully, I yeah. Know. And I noticed that they, the Lord won the battles. You know, they often refer to yeah. the Lord. Oh, the yeah. Battles. He used so these in great and wonderful and mighty ways. Yes. Yeah. Other questions, thoughts, reflections? Well, who would like to read chapter 24 for us? Janet, thank you. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and number the people, that I may know the number of the people. <coughs> but Joab said to the king, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of my lord the king still see it. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? 
But the king's word prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. They crossed the Jordan and began from Arawer and from the city that is in the middle of the valley toward Gaz and on to Jazer. Then they came to Gilead and to Kadesh in the land of the Hittites. And they came to Dan, and from Dan they went around to Sidon and came to the fortress of Tyre and to all the cities of the Hivites and Canaanites. And they went out to the Negev of Judah at Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to the king. In Israel, there were 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. But David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done, but now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Shall three years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time, and there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arona, the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, <coughs> Behold, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. <coughs> and Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ar Aruna the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word, as the Lord commanded. And when Aruna looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aruna went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. And Aruna said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said, To buy the threshing floor from you, in order to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Aruna said to David, let my lord the king take him, take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering, and the threshing sledges, and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Aruna gives to the king. And Aruna said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. But the king said to Aruna, No, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David there built an altar, built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. Okay. So we start with a big issue here. One of those verses that's difficult. Just if you would, I've got a couple books in my office. Hard sayings of the Bible, difficult passages of the Bible. This is one that's included. Because we start with, the Lord is angry at Israel, and he incites David against them. That's not 
behavior that we often attribute to the Lord. It's even more interesting or more difficult, depending on how you look at it, when you read the companion passage, then Satan stood against Israel and incited David. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. So we've seen similar things just in First and Second Samuel. Back in Saul's time, when God allows an evil spirit to torment Saul, we see it in the book of Job, that showdown between God and the evil one that Job never finds out about. He never learns what's going on. Um, or when God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Those are mysterious and difficult things to think about. We don't tend to think of God in this way, but it's dealing with that interplay, that mysterious, that we're never going to be able to fully reconcile, that God is fully in charge. God is directing the events of history, sometimes positively directing the events, sometimes allowing things to happen. But while God is always in charge, that never removes the responsibility from me for my own actions. Somehow God can be in charge and I can have a choice and how I live, and both of those things go together. I can't fully reconcile it in my mind, but thankfully I'm not God, so I don't have to. Um, I just know it's a mystery, and, and sometimes God allows us to fully experience the results of our sinful desires. Or as it says in Romans, he hands us over to our sinful desires. Fine, you want to do it that way? I will allow you to do it that way and I will allow you to experience the direct consequences of doing it that way. I think more often than we realize, God holds us back from stuff. And praise God he does, right? So I think that's one what is kind of happening here. God is angry with David and with Israel. We're never told why. We don't know what happened. We so don't know what they did. It isn't the census that he's angry about. No, but he and he allows that to happen. It starts off, he's angry before David has even done that. Okay. But he's also angry because of the census, and we have to get into that issue as well. Is it because the numbers should have been a whole lot Hold on a second. Yeah, we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Um... So, thank you. Um, I think because of God's anger, he allows David to do this thing that is not in his will. Now, the problem is there are other places in the Old Testament where a census is taken and God has no problem with it. So, again, this is another, there's something else going on here. Um, taking a census in and of itself is not sinful. God allows that. In fact, God commissions that in the book of Exodus. They count the people that came out of Egypt. But nowhere here does God tell David to take a census, and nowhere does God, David ask, Lord, should I take a census? David just decides on his own that he's going to do this. And we see from verse 9, the reason he's doing this is David wants to know, how big is my army? How many fighting men do I have? Now, has David ever, ever won a battle yet that we've read about because he had more men than the other side? Nope. So he's trusting his army rather than God. That's got to be a big part of it. What'd you say? He's trusting his army instead of God. Usually quite the opposite. Usually these battles are won and the soldiers have not done a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, remember the time God thundered from on high and that won the battle. He won the battle with thunder. You know, yeah, it's over and over again. God is the one who delivers 
his people. But so on the one hand, this could be pride. Look at how big my army is. We're not going to go into the Freudian implications of that, but armies that can be there, you know. Or not so much pride in my army, but what you're saying, it's, I, I don't trust the Lord. I trust in my men, in my military technology. I've got better spears, better bows, better arrows, better chariots, better horses, better whatever. Tanks, bombs, guns, you know. And I trust in that. Um, we are told in the book of Exodus, chapter 30, the Lord said to Moses, when you take a census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life, buy back his life, in other words, to the Lord when you number them, that there shall be no plague among them when you number them. Each one who is numbered in the census shall give a half a shekel. Did anybody give any half shekels? No. Like a tie. Similar. It's you belong to the Lord, and if you pay this half shekel, you can go back to living your life. We didn't pay any half shekels. The half shekels were going to stop a plague from happening, right? <laughs> what did we have? Plague. 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 You have to think that's significant, right? Yes. Maybe it's all of those things all put together, you know. But we have here David essentially, again, seizing something that does not belong to him. He's not supposed to be like all of the other kings. All of the other kings around them owned the army. It was their army to do what they wanted with. David. Arrogance. What? Arrogance. Oh, just a bit. It's hard not to be arrogant when you're king, right? <laughs> David wasn't supposed to be like that. This was God's army, right? And he was God's king serving under God's command. God was the true king of Israel. He allowed David to reign and he gave great blessings to David. But David kept taking things that didn't belong to him. Beginning with Bathsheba. And then Uriah's life. And then, you know, over and over we see more and more where David forgets he's not supposed to be like all of the other kings around him. And so... He sends Joab to do this census, and Joab protests. Folks, if Joab recognizes <laughs> that this is not good, uh, hello, McFly, there's your first clue. Joab, who's had no conscience, basically, up to this point, develops a conscience and says, I don't think we should do this. And again, in the companion telling of this story in First Chronicles, Joab gets so disgusted that he doesn't finish the job. He just completely forgets to count any Levites or Benjaminites. <laughs> Oops. You know, it's hard to count over 10 to do all 12 tribes. It's just, it's a lot. Math is hard. So you get a different number in First Chronicles. Uh, because, yeah, because Joab, you know, and so we're told, we're either given the route, they start on the other side of the Jordan in a place called, I've got a map here that I, because of copyright issues, was not able to copy for you, but uh, he starts down in the southeast and goes up clockwise around doing his counting. Interestingly, counting men from areas that David controls but are not technically Israel. You know, Tyre and Sidon are mentioned. Those are in modern day Lebanon. So he's counting people that are not Israelites and are adding them into the Israelite <laughs> army because we all know the lesson, right? Bigger is better, right? Especially when it comes to armies. 
So was he under their rule? Or, I mean, were those people under? They his were rule? under his rule at this point, but to count them as Israelites, when that has an ethnic that? meaning as well as yeah, they're under his authority, but they're still foreigners. You're not sure you'd want them fighting, you know, with you. So Joab comes back, tells them we've got 800,000 in the Israelite army, 500,000 in Judah. Again, we're already seeing that split before it officially happens. It's already happening. And David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. But before God sends the prophet Gad to him. So there's still hope for the old boy, right? <laughs> he realizes I've done the wrong thing without even being told. Eugene Peterson writes, David doesn't always obey God, but he always deals with God. Even when he disobeys God, he goes back to God. And that's really the wonderful lesson of the life of David is he's able to admit when he's wrong. And you know and I know there are people out there that are never wrong, right? It's never their fault. The sun was in my eyes. I didn't get enough hugs as a child. Whatever, you know. It's never my fault. David, I think this is why we can keep calling him the man after God's own heart. He's able to say what Saul could never say, I have sinned. And so he confesses his sin. I've sinned greatly in what I have done, but now, O oh Lord, please take away my iniquity, for I have done very foolishly. And then David arises, and the word of the Lord comes to him through the prophet Gad. And he's given a terrible choice. Which would you pick? Three years of famine, three months of being on the run from your enemies, or three days of pestilence, plague in the land. Get the least. <laughs> three days versus three months versus whatever. Well, time-wise it is. Yeah. It's the most intense but the shortest amount of time. And him being on the run, that would impact probably just him, not anybody else. That's what I wonder. So if it was just him on the run, and if all the other people would have been spared, that would have been That amazing. might have been the better one. I, I don't know. I mean, we, we saw when he was on the run from Absalom, he no, took a whole bunch of people with him. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, so, and, and what happens in that three months to your kingdom? That's true. You know because the other ones in fact definitely all the people right and that's we saw god was angry at israel and incites david and the punishment comes on israel and david so he kind of hedges a little bit he says i'm in great distress let us fall into the hand of the lord his mercy is great but i don't want option two <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to fall into the hand of man. And so God picks option three. And it puts that whole COVID-19 thing into perspective, right? Mm -hmm. 70,000 people die in three days. We just don't realize how blessed we are to live in the 21st century. Because I can't imagine digging that many graves. You know, that's another whole public health issue that you've got all of a sudden tens of thousands of bodies to deal with. Yeah, uh, I mean, our little pestilence in those two years was bad enough. You know, I don't, I don't care to go through that again. But this, my goodness, I can't even imagine. Um, and interestingly, it's described in a way like the angel of death going through Egypt. This is the angel of plague systematically going through Israel and this is actually 
we see God relent at some point. God is merciful even in this punishment in that clearly this was going to be more and God pulls back in mercy as they go to Jerusalem, as they reach Jerusalem. Yeah. Because um, at the threshing floor of Orana, the Jebusite, remember the Jebusites were the original owners of Jerusalem, it was originally called Jabus. And David conquered it and renamed it Jerusalem and established his capital there. So this may have happened early. Remember, these, these last stories are told out of order. So this may have been early in his reign. David speaks to the Lord. He sees the angel striking the people. Lord, let me never see anything like that. I don't want to see that. And again, behold, I have sinned. I have done wickedly. But these, these sheep, what have they done? I'm the shepherd. The flock is being struck. Please let your hand be against me and my father's house. What a, a selfless thing to pray, showing that David still has the heart of a good king, that he wants to spare his people their suffering. But, of course, our sins always affect other people, right? It's never just a private sin. It always affects other people. Now, here's where we end with hope. This last little section here where David builds an altar. Because this is a really important altar and this is a really important place. The threshing floor of around on the Jebusite, here's where we see God bringing good out of a terrible, horrible set of circumstances. Again, this is now Jerusalem. Jebusites owned this. Even when David conquered, it seemed there were some people that still owned some, some land. And David goes to purchase this threshing floor so that he can build an altar to mark the place where that plague angel stopped. This is going to be the remembrance. This is going to be the monument. And it's going to be a place of worship where we again ask God to stop punishing for our sins. This is where the big thing is going to happen where we, where God does his covenant work. Remember, this is all about God being faithful to the covenant. And David spends his own money to purchase this. He says, I'm not going to accept this as a gift. I'm never going to offer a sacrifice that costs me nothing. He's the one that ordered the census. He's the one that pays for this altar. He purchases it outright. And because of this, we're told the plague is averted from Israel. In the Chronicles version, we're told fire falls from heaven accepting these sacrifices that are offered on this altar. Now, why is all this important? Let me read to you why. First Chronicles chapter 22, verse 1. David builds this altar. The fire falls from heaven. Then David says, Here shall be the house of the Lord God. And here, the altar of the burnt offerings for Israel. That becomes the site of the temple. Oh. And we're later told that also, coincidentally, that also is the exact place, it's also called Mount Moriah, where Abraham built the altar that he was going to offer Isaac on, and at the last minute, God provided what? A substitute to die in Isaac's place. So at this place in Jerusalem is going to be the temple of the Lord and the place where the substitute 
is offered where God provides a lamb to take away the sins of the world. Do you get it? God being faithful, keeping his promises, moving toward the fulfillment of the covenant, even while his people are doing all manner of horrible, terrible things. Is our God not so very good? Yes. He is so good. And so from this point, then we know David begins to start moving toward building that house of the Lord. We've got that story of bringing the ark where David completely fumbles that, you know. And then that promise from God in chapter 7, you're not going to build a house for me. I'm going to build a house for you. There will always be a descendant of yours sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. Jesus fulfills that promise as well. He says, your son will build the house. And so David spends the rest of his reign gathering all of the supplies. All those stones. A lot of stones and cedar logs and all of the other stuff that is needed. And you, those of you that remember when we studied first and second kings, as soon as Saul, you know, David dies the first two chapters, Solomon becomes king and boom, he starts to build the temple. And isn't that also where Jesus was tried and the curtain ripped? That's where the curtain ripped. Okay. He was tried in the vicinity. Right. He was crucified. If he not, he wasn't crucified in the temple, but right, in that right. area. Yeah. 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 Very and that's close. where it all took place. All to that area. Place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely amazing. And, of course, there's even more symbolism that this was a threshing floor. I've never threshed in my life, okay? But I've read about it because there's a lot of threshing that goes on in the Bible. A threshing floor was generally on a hill because threshing was separating the kernel, the grain, from the husk. And it often meant throwing the grain up in the air. So you need a wind. So that's why you're up on a hill and it would blow away the husk and the grain would fall in a lovely golden heap on the ground. It's a place of separating the good and the bad. (coughs) Separating the good and the bad. Which is a great way to describe worshiping at God's house, right? There are those who will truly worship and those who will not. We'll go and stand before the Lord and we've either accepted the salvation that he freely offers as a gift or we haven't. There'll be sheep and there'll be goats. All of this symbolism, it's almost like there was a plan. (laughs) I don't really want to go that far. Yes, you actually do want to go that far. So God brings an incredible good out of a story of sin and rebellion. Just like the story of Joseph in Genesis, where his brothers sell him as a slave, And he goes on to save the world, basically, the known world from famine, just like Jesus' own sacrifice, a terrible, terrible sin. You know, they sinned against him right and left, and from that came our salvation. That's why we call it Good Friday. It's a terrible day, but it's a Good Friday. So we end with an incredible note. It's part of why I love First and Second Samuel. I know it's been a while since we looked at First and Second Kings, but those of you that have enjoyed the story, please keep reading. Um, we'll end. You, you'll begin with the end of David and the beginning of Solomon, and then it just keeps going. Um, I hope you've enjoyed these twenty-nine weeks. They're all well, mostly on YouTube. There were a couple weeks where we experience technical difficulties, but we still love Lisa and Olivia. <laughs> Say thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. Thank you. And Tom. <laughs> so again, just as a reminder, no Bible study next week, but we will come back on May 1st and May 8th, and we'll spend two weeks studying the book of Titus. Oh. 
And I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's probably been a while since any of you have read the book of Titus, right? There's a book of Titus. Three chapters. So we'll study that and then we'll be done for the season. Wasn't he a scribe? No, he was uh, one of Paul's missionary companions. Okay. Any other questions, thoughts Did before you say we? that there's a mosque built on the temple site now? There are two. The Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Yeah. Say that again. The Dome of the Rock yes. and the Al-Aqsa Mosque okay. are built on the Temple Mount. Yeah. So the, the rock is supposed to be the place where Abraham offered they say Ishmael, the Bible says Isaac. No, we say Isaac, you know, it's the Bible yeah. between the brothers. Yeah. So how, how old was he when he was happy? Do we, I mean, you said this is out of order. Do we know? He was probably in his 30s. Probably wasn't long after um, David. It probably wasn't long after he became king. Maybe about 40. Yeah. Is that what happened? Oh, the story. Oh, this story. Okay. Yeah. I got you. Working at the census. Yeah. Because if it's around the time he conquered Jerusalem, so he that was early in his reign. Yeah. I'm guessing there. Yeah. Let's close with a word of prayer. Thank you for all these people, Lord. It's wonderful to see the room filling up again. We are so grateful for this time of Bible study. We're so grateful for your word and the hope that it provides. Lord, help us to remember these things, to be encouraged by these things, to encourage others with these things. And we pray that you'd be with us in our time of hiatus and bring us back in two weeks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>